Well, good morning. Welcome to the branch. Glad you are with us. Seems like as soon as the calendar turned to like late September, early October, fall descended upon central Virginia. So um, it's got me in my gloomy state. So I apologize <laughs> if I'm like melancholy up here. But um, and we're talking about emotions today as we continue looking at margin. But um, just reading, we're going to read through a psalm later on, but in Psalm 110, the, the psalmist writes this, Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And I think we, if we haven't been there, we probably will be, or maybe we, we are even currently there, that place where we wonder, is God really there? Is he listening? Um, and so uh, as we we're in the right place coming to seek him in that and so why don't we stand as we uh, worship together seated above throned in the father's love destined to die for all mankind God's only son perfect and spotless one he never sinned suffered as if he did all authority every Savior, 
worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our praise, for you are the King, Jesus, and Jesus, awesome and Awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your name, for you overcame. This is a new song to us, though it's not a new song. But just as we come together in community and we lift our voices, we lift up our prayers, we lift up our praises, we lift up our concerns and our requests, we just want to acknowledge God for who he is. We want to say, Jesus, we love you. And so uh, if you need to sit back and kind of let these words wash over you as we sing, as you become more familiar with the song, so be it. But it's a simple, simple chorus where we just say we love you, Jesus. And, uh, so, all things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we that you're getting the, the melody. Let's go back and sing that first verse again. All things have that you've done for all that you've done. 
done we will pour out a love this will be our anthem song jesus we love you oh how we we come before you this morning we are grateful that that God wherever we are whether we're feeling like we're on the top of the mountain whether we feel like we're in the valley or anywhere in between that God we know that you're there with us that you meet us there in that place that God you see us you know us you love us and so God as we continue to come together as a community we look in your word we celebrate this meal that that you and your disciples celebrated together that god we would be mindful of what we receive through you what we receive from each other in community sharing life together being transformed and shaped and molded into who you call us to be And so, God, we give you ourselves, knowing that you take all of who we are, even when we feel broken and cast aside, and you restore us and you use us for your glory. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be be seated. I'm looking at the kids and saying, be dismissed. But kids can be dismissed. Y'all can be seated. We as human beings have a love-hate relationship with emotions. Um, (laughs) Those of us who have the strength of empathy, see if I can speak my words this morning, may have a hard time distinguishing between where our emotions start and someone else's stop. We may feel sometimes like Our emotions can cloud our judgment even when we have to make decisions in our lives. Um, Some of us might struggle with with depression and come to that place where where we feel like we've got to be on all the time for everybody else. And meanwhile, deep inside, we're just dying. And we feel like there's just... Uh, we're barely holding on, but we've got to put on this front and this face that, hey, everything's great. You know, others of us have been taught that that's the way we're supposed to be. Put on a front, put on a face, 
and uh, stuff down those emotions as far as you possibly can. You know, they're not reliable. Uh, in fact, um, they're of the devil, and you need to just run away from them. They're not safe. They need to be avoided, and, any, and doing anything less would be to acknowledge our weakness and, and, and vulnerability. You know, never let them see you sweat. Definitely don't let them see the chinks in your armor and expose your, your weakness or your vulnerability that someone else might take advantage of at some point in the future. You know, if we're honest, we experience highs and lows in life. Uh, if, you, if you haven't, then congratulations. Talk to me about your secret at some point. Um, but for me, <laughs> I've been there before. Um, traditionally, the fall has not been my favorite season. And so I, you know, some people are like, how is that possible? I love the fall. Oh, pumpkin spice everything, you know. And I just, that's just, it's not me. Um, and, and I struggle. You know, I, I, if I'm honest, I've had enough happen in my own life that any time that I feel like I, I hit this, this high point in my life, I'm always looking around over my shoulder, bracing myself for what's going to kind of knock me down. And I'm almost afraid to, to rejoice and relish that moment because of what's lurking like right behind it. There's troughs and there's valleys in life. I, I brought my little bobblehead this morning. Someone thought it was a bobblehead of me. So um, I was like, I didn't realize I was that fat, but I, I guess I, I guess I am. Um, this is Charles Spurgeon. See, I keep that in my office as a reminder. And um, somebody, I, I read a lot of books, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, first of all, I can never remember what I'm reading and where I read something. Uh, the other thing is that everyone recommends books to you too. So thanks to my friend Sam out there, um, we are reading a book together called Spurgeon's Sorrows, which um, is about the struggle emotionally that Charles Spurgeon, who is a famous pastor, had with his own emotions. And this is what he said. He said, the mind can descend far lower than the body, for in it there are bottomless pits. The flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and no more, but the soul can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour. And some of you are like, I have no idea what he's talking about. And then others of you are like, oh my gosh, he read my diary. I can't believe that uh, he can articulate something like that. C.S. Lewis, who we've talked about a lot in this series on margin, he understood the emotionality of human beings as well. And in 1963, he wrote this. He said, No natural feelings are high or low, holy or unholy in themselves. They're all holy when God's hand is on the rain. They all go bad when they set up on their own and make themselves into false gods. So two perspectives on emotions and as we've been doing is throughout the series as we've been looking at this idea of creating margin in our lives today we talk about that idea of emotional margin what do we do with that and we've been looking kind of through the lens of C.S. Lewis's book The Screwtape Letters a book that he wrote as kind of an imaginary uh, thinking about what the exchange would be between uh, a demon in training and his seasoned and, uh, and experienced uncle. And in that, Uncle Screwtape writes to his nephew and says this. He says, humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. The enemy's determination to produce such a revolting hybrid was one of the things that determined our father to withdraw his support from him. Now, remember, when he says our father, he's not talking about our father. He's talking about our father, right? Like the devil. OK, so as spirits, they belong to the eternal world. But as animals, they inhabit time. This means that while their spirit can be directed to an eternal object, their bodies, passions, and imaginations are in continual change. For to be in time it means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy, therefore, is undulation. The repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall back, a series of troughs and peaks. If you had watched your patient carefully, you would have seen this undulation in every department of his life. His interest in his work, his affection for his friends, his physical appetites, they all go up and down. 
As long as he lives on earth, periods of emotional and bodily richness and liveliness will alternate with periods of numbness and poverty. The dryness and dullness through which your patient is now going are not, as you fondly suppose, your workmanship. They're merely a natural phenomenon which will do us no good unless you make a good use of it. So, even again, C.S. Lewis acknowledging the fact that in life, we experience those highs and lows, those valleys and troughs as well as the mountains. And so I firmly believe that God's created us as holistic creatures. It means we're physical, we're emotional, we're intellectual, we're spiritual, and we're social. But as we consider that in our own lives and we consider this idea of emotion today, what do we do with that? What does it look like for us to have margin in the area of emotions? What does it look like for us to actually have emotionally healthy lives? In the Bible, David was just a young man when God called him to be king. And once he was called, his life uh, was filled with all kinds of different turmoil. Right away, King Saul, who was Saul at the time, uh, began to to take... uh, a major dislike to him because he knew that this was the guy who was going to take over for me. And so David um, embraced some of those emotions that he felt as he experienced this older king who wanted to kill him and would even at some point in, in his life would hurl spears at him and, and do everything that he could to, to basically squash him down. David understood what it meant to, to have emotion and then to honestly express it. In fact, David became really good friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. And when Jonathan died, he expressed his emotion in that. In 2 Samuel 1, 26, he, he said this. He said, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Now, you will not find many guys that would articulate that. You know, they're all like, hey, how's it going? You know, give me a fist bump, whatever. You know, but to actually acknowledge that here's some deep emotion that I feel towards a guy. And unlike, you know, what our culture might say, you know, there's, there's nothing sexual there. It's a, it's a connection between them in this emotional bond that David and Jonathan had with one another. A man who's in touch with his feelings. He was a musician. He was a, a poet. He was a king and a shepherd. And it's like, I thought I was kind of schizophrenic in my interest. David makes me feel a little bit better because he's got all these different interests kind of put together in one. And in Psalm 6, David gives us a picture more of his honesty with these emotions. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Psalm chapter 6. And this is what we read. It's up on the screen. I'm reading in the New International Version. He writes this, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? Turn, Lord, deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They'll turn back and suddenly be put to shame. And David expresses his emotions in such a deep and honest way. And what can we learn from David in how he expresses these emotions? First of all, I think what we learn from David is that we need to be honest about our emotions. You know, for those of us who have been raised to say, oh, I can't trust them, I need to squash them down, don't let me feel them, or people like me who are like, that that feels too big for me, so I don't want to touch it. Let me push it away. Instead, uh, we need to be honest about them. You know, so many of us, I think, have been taught that we need to just, you know, if it's not trustworthy, then just put it away. Hide it and forget about it. Um, Peter Scazzaro, who is a pastor in New York, 
has some great stuff about um, emotional health. Uh, one of the books that I'm uh, quoting from today is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a, a great book that uh, he talks about this idea of, of learning how to move into that space of being healthy in our emotions. And one of the things that he says is if we aren't emotionally healthy, we can never be spiritually healthy either. And again, because we are holistic creatures and God created us as such, he, he doesn't say, hey, get physically healthy, but it's okay if your spiritual life and your emotional life are a train wreck. No, he's saying, hey, how do we move towards a place of wholeness and health in every one of the areas of our lives? Because if we're not moving towards that, if we're not emotionally healthy, then we're never going to be spiritually healthy. And it's going to start manifesting itself in so many different ways in our lives. He writes in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Scazzaro says this, he says, It's true that some Christians live in the extreme of following their feelings in an unhealthy, unbiblical way. It's more common, however, to encounter Christians who do not believe they have permission to admit their feelings or express them openly. I, I mean... Maybe you've been in that place before. Maybe you've been in churches. Maybe you've heard pastors who have said, hey, whatever those emotions are, like turn them aside, forget about them, you can't trust them, go away. I'm telling you right here, that's not what God calls us to. He says that we need to take them out. We need to be honest with them. Put them in front of us. And some of you may or may not be familiar with the Enneagram. Uh, it's a personality profile and um, typology that, that kind of, puts people into these different categories. I'm an Enneagram 8, so the emotion that I do well is anger. And one of the things that I've really had to wrestle with over the last couple years is, does this really mean I'm angry or is it hiding something else? Because me being vulnerable means that I need to say, hey, that's not really anger. In fact, um, I just had this conversation not too long ago with one of my kids. Because anger came out, and I realized that that anger was masking something else deep inside. It, it was fear. That if I was really honest, and I pulled that anger out, and I looked at it, and I said, yeah, it doesn't really mean I'm angry. It really means that deep inside I'm scared to death. And I need to be honest with that. And you know what? It sucks. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. But once I get it out, once I say, okay, what is this? And what am I supposed to do with this? Then I have to ask myself, like, is this really coming from where I think it is? Or is it hiding something else in my life? And I think sometimes when we pull out those emotions in our lives and we kind of take a look at them, we put them on the table, we say, where is this coming from? And God can give us enlightenment as well about where, where did this come from? Then we start moving to this place of, of health and wholeness again. You know, two things as we think about David and we look at his whole life and consider him and that we can see about him and his emotions. First of all, David was a man after God's own heart, right? Like that's, he's the only person in the Bible that anyone ever, that was, that phrase was used of. You know, nobody else is said to have been a man after God's own heart. And the second thing is he was imperfect. And, and some of us might say, well, how is that possible? Is th isn't that kind of a paradox? Like those two don't really fit well together. And yet to me, the way that I see it is that God loves imperfect people. He, he loves us even in our brokenness, even in that place where we're we're saying, you know what, God, I don't feel like I've got anything. I feel like all these emotions are, are clouding my judgment. They're, they're suffocating me. David was a guy who committed adultery and murdered. He was still called a man after God's own heart. And God still loved him. And maybe there's one, someone here today, either here in, in the space or watching after the fact or listening after the fact that needs to hear this. That if you feel like your emotions are like completely out of control and you're, you're thinking to yourself, you know, how could God ever use me? Hear this now. God loves you. And God wants to heal you from feeling like you're completely out of control in that area. 
And that's what we see David do. We, another thing that we can learn from David is that he, yeah, he acknowledged those things, but he didn't just leave them there. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to put them on the table and then peace out, I'm gone. He said, I'm going to put them on the table. I'm going to see what I can see and make of them. And then I'm going to say, God, I need you to look at this and say, hey, what do I do with this? I mean, David admits his groaning and crying. I mean, these these verses, like if you have any empathy in your heart, you're thinking like you just got to give him a hug after this, right? Like all night long, I flood my bed with with weeping and I drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. I mean, that's some deep emotion that David is expressing there. But then David goes on. And he says, away from me, all you who do, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. We need to believe and trust that when we share that deeply and honestly with God about what's going on in us, that he hears us. But we don't just simply bring it uh, to him. We do need to unpack it and say, hey, where is this coming from? What's the origin here? And then we also have to be willing to call out those emotions and fears. You know, over the last few years, especially, I feel like this idea of authority and God's authority over all things has has really kind of come through for me. And realizing that sometimes we just need to name things. We need to call them out. And we need to trust that the power and authority of God is going to vanquish those things. It's going to knock them down. And so if there's an emotion that we're struggling with that we feel like it's taking over us, then call it out. Like, hey, God, take this anger. Man, I, I hate to admit my weakness. But sometimes that's what God's calling us to do. He's saying, put it on the table, call it out, and say, "God, my God's got authority over it. I don't, but guess what? Through his authority, I have his authority. What did Jesus say before he ascended into heaven? He said, all authority, not some authority or or 10% of authority. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he extends that to us as he calls us to go into the world and make disciples. That authority that God has and that's been given to Jesus is given to us as well. And we have dominion over those things. Scazzaro also writes this in his book. He says, When we do not process before God the very feelings that make us human, such as fear or sadness or anger, we leak. Our churches are filled with leaking Christians who have not treated their emotions as a discipleship issue. Have you been leaked on before? I'm not talking about a little dog coming by and peeing on your leg. I'm talking about other people in your life leaking on you because they haven't dealt with the emotion that they're dealing with. Like, it's not fun. I I can guarantee you that someone out there somewhere is saying, John leaked on me. You know, you can turn on to your neighbors and say, hey, I'm leaking, right? All of us will leak if we don't. That's the thing. Like, those of us who have been taught to just squash it down, I mean, the engineer in me is thinking about pressure buildup and stuff, right? Like, you can squash stuff down as far as you think that it will go, but it will always rear its ugly head. And eventually, it'll leak. It'll leak out. And man, I see this all the time. You know, I've had some incredibly emotional weeks as of lately, and I know that I've been leaking all over the place. And, like, this is not intended towards this person or this person or this person, but because I haven't said, hey, God, here's the, here are these emotions. Take them. Do something with them because I am powerless against them. Like, th- I'm going to just start leaking all over. It's an unhealthy response towards the emotions that we have. The Apostle Paul writing to 
the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 10.5. He writes this. He says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. If Jesus is Lord, then guess what? He's Lord over our emotions as well. You know, sometimes within the church, sometimes within evangelical circles, we focus so much on the salvation of God and the salvation of Jesus being about me and after I die. But how about here and now? How about salvation? How about the gospel meeting my emotions in the place where I need him the most? The gospel is for salvation, yes, saving all of us, but every single part of us. Oftentimes, we aren't comfortable enough with our emotional selves to look at them, let alone to give Jesus the freedom, the power, and the authority to take them and transform them. Do we trust that, that when we'll bring those emotions to him, that, that he can handle them? That, because we can't, and maybe you're still trying. Like, if you're still trying, God bless you. Uh, I can't. One of the things that we've said throughout this series, and I'm going to keep, until we bring this series to a close, keep saying it, is that part of having margin in our lives is admitting our own inability to do things, our own weaknesses and insufficiencies. Our capacity to do something or not do it. And part of that is in our emotional lives. So what do we do with this? You know, if you do read through Scazzaro's books at all, one of the things he talks about is that some of this place where we come to where we're not always emotionally healthy is has been handed down to us. I'm not saying, like, we've all got daddy issues or mommy issues, but, you know, our parents have done the best that they could given what they were given. And then we try to do a little bit better for the next generation. So one of the questions we have to have to ask is, how were you taught to handle your emotions? You know, this isn't to throw shade at our parents at all, but it's just to acknowledge it, to say, hey, you know what? My parents didn't handle emotion well at all. Like, they were really bad at it. They squashed it down. Or, or they, they were like either all or nothing, and it was either like rage or it was like, in, like unfeeling, stone. But be honest about it. You know, if, if it means having a hard conversation with your parents, hey, have at it. Second question is this. Are we giving our emotions the margin that they need? Look, like, I, I, I know we can go to the extremes here. I'm not saying let's go get our guitars, put a fire pit around, sing kumbaya, and all have our lovey-dovey feelings with one another. I, that's not what I'm saying here. I'm, I'm saying just be honest with them. When, when something extreme comes out, ask where it came from. Why is it there? And what do I need to do with it? And what can God do with it? And so practically this week, what steps can we take towards emotional margin and health? You know, maybe it means like talking to somebody. Maybe it means like, Hey, you know, for, for a long time, I, th I, think, um, I, I think we're in a place in our country where, where mental health is, is losing some, some of the stigma that has surrounded it for a long time. I think we're in a, a better place as a country now where we can acknowledge that, hey, maybe there might be something going on, something like depression or, or other things. Um, there's emotions there that are, are running rampant, and we may need to talk to someone. We may be at a place where we've stuffed it down for so long that we need to say, hey, I need a doctor, I need a psychiatrist, I need somebody who can prescribe something because physiologically in my life, I have squashed it down so much or I've had so much trauma in my life that I, I need something that's going to help me overtake it. I believe that God uses doctors and other professionals to help us move towards a place of health and wholeness um, and that he can do that and that if we need to, we need to seek that out. You know, I'm not going to say, hey, everyone's going to be healed by like me putting their hand on them and that's it. No. God gives gifts to all people and he uses those people uh, for his glory as well. So what can we do this week to understand and to become a little bit more emotionally healthy than we were last week. You know, think about emotional people in life 
I mean, the disciples were full of <laughs> some emotional people. I mean, Peter, you know, he's one of the people in the Bible that I look to and I say, man, like if you ever want to feel better about your own emotional outburst, just look at Peter, man. I mean, he pulled out a sword and cut off somebody's ear. Right? Like, I haven't gone that far. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks for that vote of confidence. <laughs> but like Jesus pulled all these people together, all these people who, who just had all these emotions. You know, one of them was a zealot and was trying to politically take over. And one of them was a tax collector. He was a cheat. He was like used to like screwing over the people around him. You know, Peter, he just, you know, he was an Enneagram 8 too. He had to be. I mean, the guy just came out like guns blazing and everything. And, and yet God, through Jesus, pulled them all together. And for three years, he invested in them. He poured into them. And then he, he, he turned over tables with them. He, he literally and figuratively did that. Because he came to this table the night that he was betrayed with his disciples, this ragtag group of emotional men coming together. And he said to these disciples, this, this meal that we've celebrated before, he, he took the bread and he broke it. And though it had never been said before, Jesus said to them, this is my body which is broken for you. They'd seen that bread. They'd seen it in the ritual of the Passover. But now Jesus was saying something different. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. And they're all scratching their heads and they're saying, well, what's he talking about? And Jesus, he took the cup and he, he poured it out. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of forgiveness poured out for many. And there in that upper room, Jesus, with that emotional crew, brought them to a place of the beginning of understanding. That in their brokenness and their emotionality and all the things that they faced all the time, the body of Jesus broken for them, the blood of Jesus poured out for them was for their health, for their wholeness, that they might be transformed to be who God called them to be. And Jesus calls us to this same table, that same table that he shared with the disciples. And he says that same thing. He said, this, this is my body. It's broken for you. This, this is my blood poured out for your forgiveness. The Apostle Paul writing to the early church, he says, we come to this table. This isn't a table that we've achieved a right on our own, but it's through the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we come to this table. And that until Jesus returns again, until we're face to face with Him, that when we come, we proclaim His death. And his resurrection and his salvation for us. Wherever we are, whatever emotional wreck we might be, Jesus meets us in that place and he says, I want to make you whole. He doesn't say, Come to the table because you are whole. He says, Come to the table and I will make you whole. And so we come to the table this morning, taking the cup and Drinking, taking the bread and eating, remembering, being reminded of the fact that Jesus did this for us. That salvation, yes, it, it gives us life eternal, but it also changes our life now. That is the gospel. That it meets us here in this place, wherever we are, and says, I'm giving you life. I'm giving you sustenance. I'm calling you to health and wholeness. So may we come to this table this morning, not a, a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Catholic table, but the table of our Lord Jesus Christ who says, come and eat and come and drink. For I am the living water and I am the bread of life.
come Wednesday. Many years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah wrote that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought our, us peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. God suffered and entered into our suffering, not so that uh, we, he could just empathize, but so that he could take it on and heal it, and that we might experience freedom you know this seemed like a, a good song for us to close with this idea that we are no longer slaves and the song says I'm no longer a slave to fear but I, I'm not I'm not the only I think I suffer from way more than just fear and maybe some of us are in that same place. So we, as we sing this song, as we stand together again, <clears throat> if you need to fill in that word with something else, you know, I'm no longer a slave to depression. It doesn't necessarily work real well with the words, but I'm no longer a slave to anger. Whatever it is, whatever that emotion is, even just calling it out trusting that God can do something with it and bring us freedom and bring us wholeness. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your 
your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer safe to be here I am a child of God I'm no longer You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned with perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through. We're down in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am the child of God. Now I'm no longer the slave to be here. I am a child. In the book of Genesis, the early chapters, it says, And God made humanity in his own image. We are all image bearers of the one who created us. And, you know, I, I don't feel like that all the time. There's plenty of times in my own life where I, I feel completely inadequate. But it's not how I feel. It's what God says. Wherever you are, no matter how you feel today, know this that you are a child of God. That you are an image bearer of the one who put you together, who, who formed your ancestors out of the dust. And he says, I make beautiful things out of the dust. And so we're just going to sing that verse over and over again for a minute. I am a child of God. And, and Maybe you feel secure this morning. You feel okay. You don't feel like you need to hear that as much. Then, hey, afterwards, go make a phone call. Go send a text. Go send a letter to somebody who may need to. Who may need to hear that word that I am something because of who created me. I am not broken to be cast out. But I am a child. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Created in His image, I am a child of God. I am a child and I am no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave. A child of God, I'm no longer a slave, I'm no longer a slave to be here. I am a child of God, I am a child of God, I am a child. Of God.
I feel like, you know, for, I feel like Forrest Gump sometimes because I always say, Mama always used to say, right? My mom always used to say, God doesn't make junk. Um, and I firmly believe that. God knit us together, like he says, like it says in the Bible, that even before, w- when we were in our mother's womb, God put us together. He knew us. He saw us. Uh, in, in all of our imperfections, our idiosyncrasies, our brokenness. And again, he didn't say, come to me and get yourself straight first. He said, come to me and I'll help you get there. I believe that God's created us uniquely with God-given gifts that we can use for his glory to expand his kingdom. It would be selfish for us to say, hey, Jesus has met me where I am. He's he's touched me. He's begun this process of transformation to say, I'm just going to keep it to myself. So part of what God calls us to is to go out into the world and do that. If you want to have more conversations about that, I would love to talk to you about that. And love to tell you about how God has brought me to a place even of of becoming a little bit more whole and healthy than I was before. Um, But we believe uh, in partnership here at the branch. And partnership happens in community. It happens as we come together and we say, hey, we share life together. We did a a series through Thessalonians not too long ago. as, As Paul said that that's what we do. We share life together. Um, and we do our best to make sure that we're publicizing that out. We're giving people opportunities to do that. Just a few weeks ago, we started our, our Around the Table dinners. And uh, we had our first one. And we invite you, if you haven't signed up already, to, to join and, and be part of one of those dinners. We've got two more, one in October, one in November. Uh, one's on a Thursday night. One's on a Wednesday night. If those times don't work, um, it's okay. Uh, we're going to do these again come January, February, March, and April. And already have some people lined up who, who want to do that. Um, the intent isn't for us to come have a Bible study or do anything other than to just enjoy one another's company. Um, and we're grateful for those who have said, hey, we want to open up our homes and invite people in and, and, and share our gift of hospitality. And so thank you for all those who have done that. Thanks of you uh, to those of you who are um, brave guinea pigs who have already attended one of these. I'm grateful for that uh, and grateful to hear the stories about people connecting and just enjoying one another's time, uh, one another's company uh, together. Um, <coughs> if you want information, you can go on our Facebook page uh, and you can check out what's going on there. Encouragement through the week as we share out stuff, too. Uh, we'd love and invite you to share that out as well. There's a now serving page on Facebook as well where you can go and and you can see some of the things that we're doing in the community. Uh, Probably this week as the email goes out, I'm going to be enlisting volunteers as we start up our tutoring program again on Tuesday nights from 6.30 to 7.30. Those of you who have done it before will probably get uh, a personal touch from me to see if I can uh, convince you to come back again. Um, It was a great experience, and if you are on the edge and want to talk to somebody who did it last year, um, I did, my son did, there are others in the room too who did, Uh, we would love for you to do it. So yeah, it's open to anyone from uh, 15 or 16 up. Um, We would love for you uh, to be a part of that and, and to help as we continue to seek the peace and prosperity of the place where God has planted us. Um, You can go on our Facebook page as well. Go on to our website. Our website has other information. If you're not on our mailing list, I do my best to only send out one email a week and not uh, flood your your inboxes with stuff. Um, So I try to put, uh, keep it as concise as possible and just tell you about a few things that are going on. If you're not on that, if you're not getting those updates, just shoot an email to thebranchashland.gmail.com. Uh, and would love to get you on that list so that you're uh, in the know about some of the things that are happening. Um, We uh, partner with others in our community. We partner with other churches. We partner with the school in our community. We partner with the YMCA, partner with the Community Service Board, uh, and are always grateful for the relationships that have been built through that. And so um, if you want, again, more information about those things, uh, you can send me an email or a message. Come talk to me. I would love to tell you about some other opportunities. We rely on partnership to continue to do what we do. Yes, we need human resources. We need financial resources as well. And so there's a few ways that you can um, partner with us financially. 
Uh, we'll put those up on the screen. Um, you can scan those different things as well if you want. Um, I know that partnership looks different for everyone and that um, depending on our stage of life, depending on what's going on, uh, we may only be able to partner in certain ways. That's fine. Understand that. Know that um, we value partnership, whatever it looks like for you. Um, if you're at a place where you can partner with us financially, we welcome that and are grateful for that. I'm grateful for how God has brought us to this place. We just celebrated three years, um, three weird years, because COVID kind of made us all have a two-year blur in there somewhere, I think, too. Um, but God's kept us here and, uh, and is growing us, and we're grateful for those who have come alongside and said, hey, we want to partner with you in ministry, in prayer, in service, financially, whatever that looks like. Um, thank you for that, for those who who are doing that, um, whether you're here in person, whether you're watching or listening online, um, we're grateful for our partners and know that we can't do it without um, partnership. We can't move to a place of whole wholeness and health uh, unless um, we're partnered with God and partnered with one another. And so as we go out into this world, as we go into this week and seek ways that, that we can be honest about our emotions and and find margin in the area of emotion. Remember, we don't do it on our own. We can't tackle this journey on our own. We do it through what God gives us. And th so may we go with the authority of God the Father. May we go with the power of God the Holy Spirit. And may we go in the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who we celebrate today. Amen.